I want to start uh, with an observation that I think is so obvious that as to be uh, virtually banal, uh, and that is that we are presently living through a crisis of very great severity and great complexity. Yet, I think, we lack a conceptual framework with which to interpret it, let alone one that could help us resolve it in an emancipatory way. Clearly, today's crisis is multidimensional, encompassing not only economy and finance, but also ecology, society, and politics. Of these dimensions, I want to single out three as especially salient. There is first, the ecological strand of crisis reflected in the depletion of the Earth's non-renewable resources and in the progressive destruction of the biosphere as witnessed first and foremost in global warming. There is second, the financialization strand of crisis reflected in the creation seemingly out of thin air of an entire shadow economy of paper values, insubstantial and yet able somehow to devastate what we call the real economy and to endanger the livelihoods of billions of people. Finally, there is the strand pertaining to social reproduction, which is reflected in the growing strain under neoliberalism on what some call care or affective labor, but what I'm going to understand more broadly as the human capacities available to create and maintain social bonds, which includes, as we'll see, the work of socializing the young, building communities, and of reproducing the shared meanings, the affective dispositions, and the horizons of value that underpin social cooperation. Now, taken singly, each of these three strands of crisis is scary enough. Put them together and you have a constellation that is truly alarming. It's the convergence of these three strands, the ecological, the financial, and the social, that constitutes, in my view, the distinctive character and the special severity of the present crisis. Under these conditions, one conclusion should be axiomatic. A critical theory for our time must encompass all three of these crisis dimensions. Certainly, it must disclose the specificity of each, but it should also clarify the ways in which the ecological strand of crisis, the financialization strand of crisis, and the social reproduction strand of crisis are intertwined. Finally, such a theory should explore the possibility that all three derive from a common source in the deep structure of our society and that all three share a common grammar. Today, however, we lack any such critical theory. Our received understandings of crisis tend to focus on a single aspect, typically the economic or the ecological, which they isolate from and privilege over the others. For the most part, ecological theorists isolate the crisis of nature from that of finance, while most critics of political economy fail to bring that domain into relation to ecology. And neither of those camps pays much attention at all to the crisis of social reproduction which has become the province of gender studies and feminist theory, and which therefore remains ghettoized. Today, however, this sort of critical separatism, as I'd like to call it, is counterproductive. In the present context, when crisis is patently tri-dimensional at the very least, we need a broader integrated approach that connects the ecological, the economic, and the social. Eschewing economism on the one hand and what I'd like to call ecologism on the other, we need to revive the project of large-scale social theorizing that tries to encompass all three dimensions of crisis and to clarify the relations among them. In elucidating the nature and roots of crisis, such a perspective should also seek to reveal prospects for an emancipatory resolution. 
Now, I want to suggest that the thought of Karl Polanyi affords a promising starting point for this sort of theorizing. His 1944 classic, The Great Transformation, elaborates an account of an earlier crisis that connects ecology, political economy, and social reproduction. The book conceives crisis as a multifaceted historical process that began with the rise of economic liberalism in 19th century Britain and proceeded over the course of a century and a half to envelop the entire world, bringing with it intensified imperial subjection, periodic economic depressions, and cataclysmic wars. For Polanyi, moreover, this crisis was less about economic breakdown in the narrow sense than about disintegrated communities, destroyed livelihoods, and despoiled nature. Its roots lay less in intra-economic contradictions than in a momentous shift in the place of economy vis-a-vis -vis society. Overturning what had been the universal relation in which markets were embedded in social institutions and subject to moral and ethical norms and to political regulation, proponents of the so-called self-regulating market, and I put this term in scare quotes because in Polanyi's view it's an oxymoron, markets cannot be self-regulating, proponents of the so-called self-regulating market sought to build a world in which society, morals, ethics, and politics were subordinated to, even modeled on, markets. Conceiving labor, land, and money as factors of production, they treated those fundamental bases of social life as if they were ordinary commodities and subjected them to market exchange. The effects of this fictitious commodification, as Polanyi called it, were so destructive of habitats, livelihoods, and communities as to spark an ongoing counter-movement for what he called the protection of society. The result was a distinctive pattern of social conflict which he called the double movement. A spiraling conflict between free marketeers on the one hand and social protectionists on the other, which led to political stalemate and ultimately to fascism and the Second World War. Well, as even this highly compressed summary suggests, here we have an account of crisis that avoids at least two forms of critical separatism. Eschewing both economism and ecologism, the great transformation interweaves an account of financial breakdown and economic collapse with accounts of the despoliation of nature and the disintegration of society, all subtended by intractable political conflicts that failed to resolve, indeed exacerbated, the crisis. Refusing to limit himself either to the economic on the one hand or to the ecological on the other, Polanyi elaborated a conception of crisis that encompasses both those dimensions as well as the dimension of social reproduction. By incorporating the latter, moreover, his framework seems to me to be capable, at least in principle, of embracing many feminist concerns and indeed of connecting them to the concerns of political ecologists and political economists. Now this point alone would qualify Polanyi as a promising resource for those of us who seek to understand the crisis of the 21st century. But there are some other more specific reasons for turning to him today. The story told in The Great Transformation has some very strong echoes in current developments. There is at least a prima facie case for the view that the present crisis was triggered by recent efforts to disencumber markets from the governance regimes, both national, international, and regional, that were established in the aftermath of World War II. What we today call neoliberalism has quite a bit in common with the very same 19th century faith in the so-called self-regulating market 
that un unleashed the crisis Polanyi chronicled. Now as then, attempts to implement that creed are spurring efforts to commodify nature, labor, and money. Just think about the burgeoning markets in carbon emissions and biotechnology, in childcare, schooling, and the care of the old, and of course, need I add, in financial derivatives. Now as then, the effect is to despoil nature, to rupture communities, and to destroy livelihoods. Today, moreover, as in Polanyi's time, counter movements are mobilizing to protect society and nature from the ravages of the market. Now as then, struggles over nature, social reproduction, and global finance constitute the central nodes and flashpoints of crisis. And so on its face, today's crisis is plausibly viewed as a second great transformation, a great transformation redux. For many reasons then, Polanyi's perspective holds considerable promise for theorizing today. Yet, we should not rush to embrace it uncritically. Even as it overcomes economism and ecologism, the great transformation turns out on closer inspection to be somewhat flawed. Focused single-mindedly on the destructive effects of so-called self-regulating markets, the book overlooks harms originating elsewhere in the surrounding society, as he calls it preoccupied exclusively with the corro cor corrosive effects of commodification upon communities, it neglects injustices within communities, including injustices such as, of an older time, slavery, feudalism, and patriarchy, that depend on social constructions of labor, land, and money precisely as non-commodities. Demonizing marketization, the book tends to idealize social protection, failing to note that protections have often served to entrench social hierarchies and social exclusions. Counterposing a bad economy to a good society, the book flirts with communitarianism and is insufficiently sensitive, sorry, insufficiently, yeah, sensitive <coughs> to domination. What's needed, I want to suggest then, is a revision of Polanyi's framework. The goal should be a new post polanyian perspective that not only overcomes economism and ecologism, but also avoids romanticizing and reifying society, thereby whitewashing domination. And that is precisely the aim of this present lecture. Seeking to develop a critique that comprehends society as well as economy, I propose to examine one of Polanyi's signature concepts, which I've already mentioned, namely the fictitious commodity. I want to argue that while this idea affords a promising basis for an integrated structural analysis of the present crisis, it needs to be reconstructed in a form that is sensitive to and critical of domination. Now I'm going to begin by sketching Polanyi's idea of fictitious commodification. He claimed, as I've already noted, that 19th century industrial capitalism inaugurated an historically unprecedented relation between economy and society. Previously, markets had been, his phrase, mere accessories of social life, and no such thing as a separate economy had ever existed. Production and distribution were organized by what we would call non-economic institutions, for example, kinship, community, and state. And they were subject to non-economic norms, for example, religious, communal, and legal, which limited what could be bought and sold, by whom, and on what terms. The idea of a so-called self-regulating market subject only to supply and demand was virtually unthinkable. All that changed, however, with the invention of the utterly novel idea of a market economy. Decisively rejecting all previous understandings, proponents of this idea envisioned a separate economic system institutionally differentiated from the rest of society and entirely directed and controlled by market mechanisms. 
In this system, all production would be organized for sale on price-setting markets, which would be governed imminently by supply and demand. Not just luxury goods, not even just ordinary goods, but all the inputs of production, including human labor, raw materials, and monetary credit, would be traded on such self-regulating markets. In other words, the necessary conditions for, for commodity production would themselves become commodities. But that meant introducing the logic of market relations into virtually every aspect of social life. What was originally envisioned as a separate economy would in Polanyi's view, inevitably colonize the surrounding society, remaking the latter in the image of the former. A market economy, Polanyi claimed, could only exist in a market society. For Polanyi, however, this idea of a market economy cum market society is inherently unrealizable. To posit that labor, land, and money can be traded like ordinary commodities is to suppose that society can be commodities all the way down. But this assumption, Polanyi claimed, is entirely fictitious, and attempts to implement it are bound to backfire. In reality, labor, land, and money have a special foundational status. Constitutive of the very fabric of social life, they also supply the necessary background conditions for commodity production. To treat them as ordinary objects of market exchange is thus to attack at once the substance of society and the indispensable presuppositions of a capitalist economy. The result could only be a crisis of society on the one hand and a crisis of economy on the other. Society, in Polanyi's view, cannot be commodities all the way down. He writes, and I quote, to allow the market mechanism to be the sole director of the fate of human beings and their natural environment, indeed even of the amount and use of purchasing power, would result in the demolition of society. For the alleged commodity labor power cannot be shoved about, used indiscriminately, or even left unused without affecting also the human individual who happens to be the bearer of this peculiar commodity. In disposing of a man's labor power, the system would incidentally dispose of the physical, psychological, and moral entity man attached to the tag. Robbed of the protective covering of cultural institutions, human beings would perish from the effects of social exposure and social dislocation. Nature would be reduced to its elements, neighborhoods and landscapes defiled, rivers polluted, military safety jeopardized, the power to produce food and raw materials destroyed. Finally, the market administration of purchasing power would periodically liquidate business enterprises. For shortages and surfeits of money would prove as disastrous to business as floods and droughts were in primitive society. Undoubtedly, labor, land, and money are essential to a market economy, but no society could stand the effects of such a system of crude fictions, even for the shortest stretch of time, unless its human and natural substance, as well as its business organization, were protected against the ravages of this satanic mill." End of quote. It's a great writer. <laughs> Now, as we shall see, this passage can be interpreted in more than one way, but its central point seems to me to be beyond dispute. Efforts to create a market society composed of commodities all the way down necessarily trigger crisis. Destabilizing nature, finance, and social reproduction, such efforts are bound to undermine both the constitutive elements of social life and the presuppositions of commodity production and exchange. They are also bound to pro uh, provoke resistance. And now the Great Transformation recounts the process by which 19th century British commercial interests sought precisely to commodify labor, land, and money. In Polanyi's account, 
Their actions set in motion a far-reaching crisis in those three dimensions. First, the attempt to create a so-called self-regulating market in that peculiar commodity labor power did indeed demoralize, quote, the human individual who happened to be the bearer of this peculiar commodity. Fracturing communities, splintering families, and fraying social bonds, this proletarianization disturbed the processes of social reproductions, re reproduction on which markets rely. Second, land enclosures, free trade in corn, and the importation of cheap foodstuffs upended agriculture and sapped the lifeblood of rural communities, even as industry pillaged the world and gouged the earth in pursuit of raw materials while polluting the air and the water. Thus, this new economic regime did indeed reduce nature to its elements and defile neighborhoods and landscapes endangering both the ecological conditions of production and the living conditions of human beings. Lastly, unbridled speculation in currency and credit instruments destabilized the money supply, causing the value of money to fluctuate wildly, wiping out savings, discouraging investment, and depriving producers and consumers alike of their ability to plan for the future. In other words, the commodification of money undermined the temporal preconditions for social and ontological security, as well as the financial preconditions for capital accumulation. For Polanyi, again, the result of fictitious commodification was necessarily crisis. Simultaneously social, ecological, and economic, this was a crisis for nature and society, as well as for capital. Now, Polanyi's idea seems to me to be remarkably prescient. Whatever its merits for the period he chronicled, his identification of nature, labor, and money as central nodes of crisis is highly pertinent to the 21st century. Equally important, his conception relates those three flashpoints of crisis to a common dynamic. Thus, the notion of fictitious commodification affords, it seems to me, the prospect of an integrated crisis theory that encompasses in one fell swoop the concerns of ecologists, feminist theorists, and political economists. Capable of connecting those bodies of thought, it promises to overcome the separatisms that currently divide and weaken critical theorizing. In effect, this concept locates all three strands of critique as interconnected moments of a broader critique of capitalism. As usually interpreted, however, Polanyi's account of fictitious commodification rests on some dubious underpinnings. These stem from the claim made repeatedly in the book that a commodity is a good or service produced for sale. Basing his argument on this definition, Polanyi contends that labor, land, and money cannot be genuine commodities because none was produced for sale. Neither labor nor land is produced at all, he claims, and although money is a human creation, it has the status of a social convention akin to language, not that of an object produced for sale. When traded, therefore, none of the three behaves like a true commodity. In each case, an original condition of not having been produced for sale destabilizes the process of marketization. Absent the proper origins, the would-be commodities can only be fictitious. Now, I want to call this the ontological interpretation of fictitious commodification. It's problematic, I think, because essentialist, ahistorical, and insensitive to domination. Appealing to an original condition, the condition of not having been produced for sale, the ontological interpretation posits that to commodify labor, land, and money is to violate their inherent nature. As a result, this approach obscures their historicity. It covers over the fact that none of the three is ever encountered pure, but only in forms that have already been shaped by human activity and relations of power. 
This interpretation fails to register, too, that long before they were marketized, so social constructions of labor, land, and money typically encoded relations of domination. I've already mentioned feudalism, slavery, and patriarchy, all of which, as I noted before, cast those three constitutive elements of social life as non-commodities. Then, too, the ontological reading orients the critique of commodification overwhelmingly to its disintegrative effects on social communities, focusing on the tendency to destroy existing solidarities and social bonds, which it implicitly assumes to have value and to be worth preserving. Associating change exclusively with decay and decline, it overlooks the possibility noted by Marx that marketization can generate emancipatory effects by dissolving modes of domination external to the market and creating the basis for new, more inclusive and egalitarian solidarities. Conversely, the ontological reading occults the fact that struggles to protect nature and society from the market are often aimed at entrenching privilege and at excluding outsiders. Just think of all the anti-immigrant forms of social protectionism we see today. Ignoring hierarchy and exclusion, it lends itself to a defensive project, protecting extant constructions of labor, land, and money, along with the domination and hearing in them, from marketization. Precluding consideration of trade-offs, this approach discourages efforts to reckon the pluses and minuses of such complex historical developments as the introduction of markets into authoritarian command economies or the opening of labor markets to women and former slaves. All told, the ontological reading inflects the critique of crisis with a defensive conservative thrust that is at best insensitive to and at worst complicit with forms of domination that are not grounded primarily in market mechanisms. What is needed then is another interpretation of fictitious commodification, one that is historicized, non-defensive, and sensitive to domination. A useful model I want to suggest is Hegel's argument in the philosophy of right as to why society cannot be contract all the way down. In that work, you'll recall, Hegel argued that a sphere of contractual relations is possible only on the basis of a background of non-contractual social relations. Efforts to universalize contract necessarily undermine it by destroying the non-contractual basis on which it depends. Adapting Hegel's argument, we might define fictitious commodification as the attempt to commodify the market's conditions of possibility. Understood in this way, attempts to fully commodify labor, land, and money are conceptually incoherent and inherently self-undermining, akin to a tiger that bites its own tail. For structural reasons, then, society cannot be commodities all the way down. I want to call this the structural interpretation of fictitious commodification. Unlike the ontological interpretation, this one does not suppose an original condition of labor, nature, and money that inherently resists commodification. It directs attention, rather, to the tendency of unregulated markets to destroy their own conditions of possibility. It constructs those conditions, moreover, as socially constructed and, I'm sorry, it construes those condi conditions as socially constructed and historically specific, as potentially intertwined with domination and as subject to contestation. It reminds us accordingly that what commodification erodes is not always worth defending and that marketization can actually foster emancipation by weakening traditional supports for domination. Freed from the communitarian bias of the ontological reading, this structural interpretation makes possible a more complex critique of capitalist crisis, sensitive not only to desolidarization but also to domination. It enhances the critical force 
of the concept of fictitious commodification. Now, just let me elaborate briefly. The structural reading of fictitious commodification foregrounds the inherently self-contradictory uh, character of free market capitalism. It is analogous in this respect to Marx's idea of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. But unlike Marx, Polanyi identifies not one, but three contradictions of capitalism, if you like, the ecological, the social, and the financial, each of which underpins a dimension of crisis. And unlike Marx, moreover, Polanyi's contradictions are not intra-economic. Far from being located within the economic system, they concern the relation between the latter and its background conditions of possibility. For Polanyi, finally, each of the three contradictions unfolds by way of a common logic. Each pertains to a necessary condition of production and exchange, which capitalism simultaneously needs and tends to erode. In the case of the ecological condition of production, what is at stake are the natural processes that sustain life and provide the material inputs for social provisioning. In the case of the social reproduction condition, what is at stake are the socio-cultural processes that supply the solidary relations, the affective dispositions, and the value horizons that underpin social cooperation, while also furnishing the appropriately socialized and skilled human beings who constitute labor and labor power. In the case of the monetary condition of production, what is at stake is the ability to conduct exchange across distance and to store value for the future, hence the capacity to interact broadly in space and in time. What is at stake in each case is sustainability, the sustainability of capitalism on the one hand and that of society and nature on the other. In principle, then, each strand of crisis lends itself to a structural critique focused on this problem of sustainability. And indeed, as a matter of fact, three different variants of such critique are presently circulating. An ecological variant claims that neoliberalism's increasingly invasive assumption of nature as a fictitious commodity today is irreparably eroding the natural basis that sustains life and supplies the material inputs for commodity production. A feminist variant holds that the increasing commodification of women's labor on the one hand and of care on the other is depleting the capacities for social reproduction on which the supply of labor power and society as such depend. Marxian and Keynesian variants claim that financialization is destroying the monetary presuppositions for capital accumulation, as well as the possibility of politically organized social protection and public provision of social welfare. Each of these critiques is powerful and deserving of further development, but each captures only one strand of a larger totality, and each, each needs to be connected to the others. Far from being ne neatly separated from one another, the three dimensions of crisis are inextricably interwoven in the deep grammar of capitalist society. Let me now suggest how they might be connected via Polanyi's notion of fictitious commodification. By reading this notion structurally, I want to show how we might decouple his three-dimensional critique of capitalism's unsustainability from the communitarian ethos to which he unwittingly joined it, and how we might link it instead to a critique of domination. I'm going to begin with the commodification of labor. Here, Polanyi was surely prescient, laying the basis in 1944 for a feminist critique of capitalism, albeit one that he himself did not develop. Not confining himself to criticizing exploitation, he situated labor's commodification in a broader perspective, the perspective of social reproduction, which, as I've said, concerns the maintenance of the social bonds that are indispensable both to society in general 
and to market exchange in particular. Adopting this perspective, Polanyi understood that proletarianization is as much about ruptured communities and frayed solidarities as about exploitation and immiseration. He understood, therefore, that unbridled commodification of labor threatens the universe of meaning, the affective dispositions and value horizons that underpin society and economy, while also jeopardizing the supply of appropriately skilled and socialized labor power that capital requires. He understood, finally, that under conditions of rampant proletarianization, social reproduction is bound to be a flashpoint of crisis and a site of struggle. As Polanyi saw it, the result could only be an epical battle between two social forces, as I've already mentioned. On the one side, the party of free market liberalism, bent on ripping labor out of its life-worldly context and turning it into a factor of production in the service of profit. On the other side, the party of social protection, set on defending the life worlds, families, and communities that have always enveloped labor and suffused it with social meaning. But for all its insight, Polanyi's perspective also harbors a major blind spot. What he failed to note was that the construction of labor power as a fictitious commodity rested on the simultaneous co-construction of care as a non-commodity. The unwaged labor of social reproduction supplied wage labor's necessary conditions of possibility. The latter could not exist, after all, in the absence of housework, child raising, schooling, affective care, and a host of other activities that maintain social bonds and shared understandings. But of course, the division between paid so-called productive labor and unpaid reproductive labor was overwhelmingly a gendered division which underpinned modern capitalist forms of women's subordination. Missing this deep-seated structure of gender domination, Polanyi risked inscribing the ideal of the family wage and these gendered relations of hierarchy at the heart of his understanding of social protection. In that case, what would be protected was less society as such than arrangements premised on gender hierarchy. The effect was to skew Polanyi's understanding of the grammar of social conflict. Neglecting the history of feminist struggles against protection, which included, after all, demands for women's right to employment, among other things, he failed to see that struggles around labor's commodification were actually three-sided. They included not just free marketeers and proponents of protection, but also partisans of what we might call emancipation, whose primary aim was neither to promote marketization nor to protect society from it, but rather to free themselves from domination. Emancipation's ranks have included feminists, as I'm suggesting, to be sure but also the billions of slaves, serfs, peasants, racialized people, Dalits, and inhabitants, inhabitants of slums and shantytown for whom a wage promised liberation from slavery, feudal subjection, racial subordination, caste hierarchy, social exclusion, imperial domination, as well as from sexism and patriarchy. Such actors have vigorously opposed the oppressive protections that prevented them from selling their labor power. But they did not, on that account, become proponents of free market liberalism. Rather, their struggles constituted a third pole of social movement above and beyond the two poles identified by Polanyi, not just marketization and social protection, but also emancipation, hence not just a double movement, but what I've proposed to call a triple movement. This revision of Polanyi enables a better understanding, I think, of the labor dimension of the current crisis. By introducing the problematic of male domination and women's emancipation, we can grasp crucial aspects of the present constellation that are occulted in more orthodox Polanyian accounts. It is true, of course, as these accounts suggest, 
that wage labor is everywhere in crisis as a result of neoliberal globalization. Just witness the ast astronomical uh, rates of unemployment, including here in Europe, attacks on unions, and the involuntary exclusion of roughly two-thirds of the world's population from any connection at all to official labor markets. But that is not all. In a further turn of the screw, much of the formerly unwaged activity of social reproduction is now being commodified. Just think of the burgeoning global markets in adoptions, childcare, babies, sexual service, elder care, and indeed in bodily organs. Now add to this the fact that it is increasingly women who are being recruited today into wage work. So neoliberalism is proletarianizing those who still do and are expected to do the lion's share of the unwaged work of social reproduction. And it is doing so at the very moment when it is also insisting on reduced public provision of social welfare and curtailed state provision of social infrastructure. The overall result is a deficit of care. To fill the gap, Global capitalism imports migrant workers from poorer to richer countries and from poorer to richer regions. Typically, it is racialized and or rural women from poor regions who take on reproductive and caring labor previously performed by wealthier, more privileged women. But to do this, the migrants must transfer their own familial and communal responsibilities to other still poorer caregivers who must in turn do the same and on and on in ever longer global care chains as they've been called. Far from filling the care gap, the net effect is to displace it from richer to poorer families from the global north to the global south. Here we see a new intensified form of fictitious commodification. Activities that once formed the uncommodified background that made commodified labor possible are now themselves being commodified. The result can only be intensified crisis as the tiger bites ever more deeply into its tail. No wonder then that struggles over the social construction of family and work have exploded in recent years. Witness the rise of feminist movements and of women's movements of various stripes, of grassroots community movements seeking to defend entitlements to housing, health care, job training, and income support, of movements for the rights of immigrants, domestic workers, public employees, and those who perform social service work in for-profit nursing homes, hospitals, and child care centers. But again, these struggles do not take the form of a double movement. They are better grasped, rather, as three-sided struggles, encompassing not only neoliberals and social protectionists, but also proponents of emancipation, <coughs> including those for whom exploitation represents an advance. Let me consider next, more briefly, the commodification of nature. Here, too, Polanyi was surely prescient, laying the basis in 1944 for an ecological critique of capitalism avant la lettre. He understood that nature is an indispensable precondition, both for social life in general and for commodity production in particular. He understood, too, that unbridled commodification of nature is unsustainable, bound to impair both society and economy. He understood finally that reduced to a factor of, produ of production and subjected to unregulated exchange, nature is destined to become a node of crisis. Such treatment too, he claimed, is bound to provoke resistance, sparking movements to protect nature and human habitats from the market's ravages. Here too, he envisioned a double movement a two-sided battle between, as we might call them, environmentalists and free marketeers. Without question, this perspective is pertinent today. In the 21st century, commodification of nature has proceeded far beyond anything Polanyi could have imagined. Just think about the privatization of water, the bioengineering of sterile seeds, the patenting of DNA. 
Such developments are far more intrusive and destabilizing than the land enclosures and free trade in corn he wrote about. Far from simply trading already existing natural objects, these forms of commodification generate new ones. Probing deep into nature, they alter its internal grammar, much as the assembly line altered the grammar of human labor. Adopting terminology used by Marx, one could say that such new forms of fictitious commodification affect not just the formal subsumption, but the real subsumption of nature into capitalism. Here, nature truly is produced for sale. In addition, the depletion of the Earth's non-renewable resources is far more advanced today than in Polanyi's time, so advanced indeed as to raise the prospect of full-scale ecological collapse. Finally, the neoliberal cure for the ills of markets in nature is, you guessed it, more markets. Markets in strange new entities such as carbon emissions permits and offsets, and in even stranger meta-entities derived from them, the so-called environmental derivatives, which are uh, uh, carbon emission tranches modeled after the mortgage-backed CDOs that nearly crashed the global financial order in 2008 products that are now being briskly traded by Goldman Sachs. No wonder, then, that struggles over nature have exploded in recent years. Just think of the rise of environmental and indigenous movements locked in battles with corporate interests and proponents of development on the one hand, and, it must be added, with workers and would-be workers who fear the loss of jobs on the other. If there were ever a time when nature is a flashpoint of crisis, it is now. But these conflicts, like those surrounding labor and care, do not take the form of a simple two-sided struggle between neoliberals and environmentalists. Like labor, nature is now a site of conflict for a much more complex array of social forces, which also include labor unions and indigenous peoples, eco-feminists and eco-socialists, and opponents of environmental racism. Here too, in other words, not a double but a triple movement. Also encompassing movements for emancipation, such struggles belie romantic eco-fundamentalist perspectives that would flat out prohibit all commodification of nature, just as the feminist critique of patriarchal protection belied romantic communitarian approaches that would ban all commodification of care work. In this case, too, what is needed is a structural critique divested of all nostalgia and linked to the critique of domination. Now I want to consider even more briefly, lastly, the commodification of money. Here, too, Polanyi is remarkably prescient. In the 21st century, financialization has achieved new heights of dizziness far beyond anything he could have imagined. With the invention of derivatives and their metastasization, the commodification of money has floated so free of the materiality of social life as to take on a life of its own. Untethered from reality and out of control, so-called securitization has unleashed a tsunami of insecurity, nearly crashing the world economy, bringing down governments, devastating communities, flooding neighborhoods with underwater mortgages, and destroying the lives and uh, jobs and livelihoods of billions of people. I don't know when this is true, but as I wrote this, financialization was, maybe still is, threatening to destroy the euro, the European Union, and any pretense of democracy as bankers routinely overrule parliaments and install governments that will do their bidding. Is it any wonder, then, that politics is everywhere in turmoil as movements both on the left and right mobilize to seek protective cover? More perhaps even than in Polanyi's time, finance is at the center of capitalist crisis. Here too, however, Polanyi's perspective harbors a major blind spot. He identified the modern territorial state as the principal arena and agent of social protection. 
Granted, he appreciated that the regulative capacities of states depend importantly on international arrangements. And so he criticized the early 20th century free trade regime for depriving European states of control over their money supplies and preventing them from adopting policies of full employment and deficit spending. But the implied solution was a new international regime that would reinstate national currency controls, thereby facilitating protective policies at the national level. What, did, what Polanyi did not anticipate was that so-called embedded liberalism, as John Ruggie has called it, that was established after World War II would serve some states far better than others. In that era of decolonization, imperialism took on a new indirect, let us say, non-political form based on unequal exchange between newly independent ex-colonies and their former colonial masters. As a result of this exchange, the wealthy states of the core could continue to finance their domestic welfare systems on the backs of the former colonial subjects. The disparity has been only exacerbated in our own neoliberal era, moreover, by policies of structural adjustment, as international agencies like the IMF have used the weapon of debt to further undercut the predict protective capacities of post-colonial states, compelling them to divest their assets, open their markets, and slash social spendings. That sounds familiar now in Europe as well, doesn't it? Historically, in other words, um, international arrangements have entrenched disparities in the capacities of states to protect their populations from the vagaries of international market, uh, markets. I would say that even the most internally egalitarian variants of post-war social democracy rested on these forms of external neo-imperial predation. Today, moreover, as many on the left have long warned, and as Greeks and Italians and Irish and Portuguese have discovered to their dismay, the construction of Europe as an economic and monetary union without corresponding fiscal and political integration has simply disabled the protective capacities of member states, or at least the poorer and weaker member states, without creating broader European level protective capacities to take up the slack. But that's not all. Absent global financial regulation, even very wealthy freestanding countries like the US find their efforts at national social protection under pressure from global market forces, the bond rating agencies, and so on, which institute a race to the bottom. The globalization of finance requires a new post-Westphalian way of imagining the arenas and agents of social protection. It, it requires arenas in which the circle of those entitled to protection matches the circle of those subject to risk. And it requires agents whose protective capacities and regulatory powers are sufficiently robust and broad to effectively rein in transnational private powers and to pacify global finance. No wonder then that present day struggles over finance do not conform to the schema of the double movement. Alongside the neoliberals and national protectionists that Polanyi foregrounded, we also find alter globalization movements, movements for global or transnational democracy, and those who seek to transform finance from a profit-making enterprise into a public utility that can be used to guide investment, create jobs, promote ecologically sustainable development, and support social reproduction while also combating entrenched forms of domination. Such actors represent a new configuration which aims to integrate social protection with emancipation. Now what all of this shows, and I'm about to conclude, is that Polanyi was right to identify labor, land, and money as central nodes and flashpoints of crisis. But if we are to exploit his his insights today, we need to complicate his perspective, connecting a structural critique of fictitious commodification to a critique of domination. 
Let me close, however, by returning to a point I stressed at the outset. The purpose of centering our understanding of crisis on nature, social reproduction, and finance is not to treat these three dimensions separately. It's rather to overcome critical separatism by developing a single comprehensive framework able to encompass all three of them and thus to con connect the concerns of ecologists, feminist theorists, and political economists. Far from being neatly separated from one another, three strands of capitalist crisis are inextricably interwoven, as are the three corresponding processes of fictitious commodification. I've already noted that neoliberals are pressing governments everywhere to reduce deficits by slashing social spending, thereby jeopardizing the capacities of families and communities to care for their members and to maintain social bonds. In other words, this response to financial crisis is precisely undermining social reproduction. I've also mentioned the new speculation in environmental derivatives. What such green finance, as it's called, portends is not only economic breakdown, but also ecological meltdown, as the promise of quick speculative super profits draws capital away from the long-term large-scale investment that is needed to develop renewable energy and to transform unsustainable modes of production and forms of life premised on fossil fuels. The resulting environmental destruction is bound to further disturb processes of social reproduction and may very well produce some rather nasty effects, including zero-sum conflicts over oil, water, air, and arable land, conflicts in which broader solidarities may give way to so-called lifeboat ethics, to scapegoating and militarism, perhaps even, once again, to fascism and world war. In any case, dire predictions aside, we can see how closely finance, ecology, and social reproduction are deeply and inextricably intertwined. This sort of analysis illustrates four major conceptual points that have been central to my argument here and that I want to restate now very briefly in closing. First, a critical theory for the 21st century must be integrative, oriented to understanding the present crisis as a whole. We make a good start at developing such a perspective by adopting Polanyi's idea of fictitious commodification so as to connect three major dimensions of crisis, the ecological, the social reproductive, and the financial, all conceived as constitutive moments of a crisis of capitalism. Second, 21st century critical theory must go beyond Polanyi by connecting the critique of commodification to a critique of domination. We make a good start here by rejecting the standard ontological reading of fictitious commodification with its defensive communitarian overtones in favor of a structural reading which is sensitive not only to desolidarization but also to domination. Third, a critical theory for the 21st century must develop a conception of the grammar of social struggle that goes beyond Polanyi's idea of a double movement, factoring in struggles for emancipation alongside those for marketization and social protection, indeed cutting across and colliding with them. It must analyze the struggles of our time via the figure of a triple movement in which those three political projects combine and collide. Finally, to mention a point that I have only hinted at here, a critical theory of contemporary crisis needs a complex normative perspective that integrates the leading values of each of those poles of the so-called triple movement. In other words, such a perspective should integrate the legitimate interests in solidarity and social security that motivate social protectionists with the fundamental interest in non-domination that is paramount for emancipation movements without neglecting the valid concern for negative liberty that has been, let's say, somewhat uh, twisted um, by free market liberals. 
embracing a broad integrative understanding of social justice, such a project would serve at once to honor Polanyi's insights and to remedy his blind spots. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Fraser, for, for this uh, excellent talk, which I'm sure will, will provoke many questions and comments. We have about 25, 30 minutes for discussion. Now, uh, if you have a question, please speak to the microphone. There will be a microphone circulating around. So uh, as, as, as you've seen, this, this is being videoed and, and, uh, and also the questions will be uh, recorded so so uh, that's why we need to use the microphone even if you have a strong voice so uh, who would like to to, to start with a mm -hmm. question okay. yes please uh, hi can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, could I could I just ask a question about the relationship between um, capitalism in general, financialization as a particular kind of capitalism, and the state? Because it, it seems to me, if you want to talk about crisis theory, you have to sort out like the relationship between these three. Uh, at least for me if you're talking about the relationship between financialization and ecological crisis, um, financialization doesn't seem that important. Like, it's a particular form of capitalism, mm -hmm. and it's expressed politically as well at the level of the state. It, it emerged in the 1970s. Uh, there, uh, there emerged a political consensus to combat inflation. But it, it seems to me that, like, the state today is not exactly, like, it, it's not an instrument of the financial bourgeoisie. It can behave differently, and we might see that hegemony evaporate and a new productivist hegemony emerge, kind of along the lines that Polanyi saw after the Great Depression. But, I mean, th that's neither here nor there, because produ productivist or financialized capitalism it seems to me that capitalism is absolutely unsustainable. Like, even if it adopts a form uh, where the state begins to s sponsor ecological technologies, it seems to me that there are absolute limits on this strategy. Even if the state uh, sponsors these technologies, and I know there is immense human creativity going into producing them, uh, the, the polluting sectors won't just disappear, and the state is not going to violate the property rights of uh, private owners of polluting uh, means of production. So uh, th that would be my uh, kind of comment and maybe a mm -hmm. uh, critical question to you. Yeah. Th thanks very much. I think that's a very um, thoughtful um, observation. Um, it is true that um, there are sort of different temporalities here. We've had um, uh, fi financialization is a sort of recurrent tendency in the history of capitalism. We have a particularly virulent uh, moment uh, now at a time uh, where um, the progress of so-called globalization has been such that the, the scale on, on which things can go bad with financialization is uh, stunning. Um, but that, that may seem, um, let's say, not as deep in a way as the ecological dimension. And so people are speaking now about carbon capitalism, right? That we're, we've got a whole, uh, you know, several hundred years now of this uh, fossil fuel development. We have the idea of a, of a, of a new uh, uh, geological uh, age, the Anthropocene, which uh, co coincides with the rise of capitalism, uh, which you know is is, is um, and I, and I agree with you that in in the past at least it ha capitalism has um, 
while still respecting um, at least many forms of important forms of capitalist private property, public powers have uh, managed to rein in uh, and regulate um, the financial dimension. And it, it, that is perhaps um, more conceivable, but I think I agree with you that the um, sort of um, transformation of the energy basis of society that would be required today to really address the ecological dimension of this would require a, um, a very deep uh, level of, uh, of regulation, if, if, if regulation is even uh, the right word, and uh, a much more, uh, more fundamental, um, dare we say, interference, let's say, with property rights. I don't, um, I mean, another way to think about this is sort of, um, is, I mean, I emphasized here the sort of analogies among the three fictitious commodities, as Polanyi does. But one could, but that, that, that there's more to be said. There are also some important disanalogies. Maybe, I mean, this is an odd way to talk, but one might say that there's some way in which the sort of ecological limits are, um, let's say, more external. The financialization limits are somehow internal, and the social reproduction one seems to me to, to be a little of both, so an in-between case. Um, the only quibble I would have with your formulation is that I don't think it's adequate now to speak of the state. I think we have to uh, uh, talk about public powers, uh, some which I don't, uh, some of which need to operate on a much broader scale than 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 uh, territory and can't even be in the same conceptual space as territorial states because so much of this is post or trans territorial. Uh, so much of what needs to be um, regulated, and this is a very um, hard thing to understand. As I said, to Polanyi's credit, he really did understand how much state cap the capacities of states to do things depended on the architecture of the broader international space in which states, uh, you know, uh, exist and are embedded. Um, but. Um, all of that uh, uh, needs to somehow be be rethought. Um, um, I think that's that's uh, central here. We can't have an ecological um, crisis can't be resolved at the level of even a a state that is very willing to go quite far in interfering with property rights. Uh, uh, and the same is true with the global finance story. That's a, a race to the bottom kind of situation. So um, we have to, I think, go beyond this notion of the state uh, to think about public, some new organization of public power. Tuja Pulkkinen. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for your talk, which uh, touched so many crucial issues of our time at the moment and, and, and in a comprehensive way. I, I, I particularly, I, I very much like your way of opposing, um, of constructing the, uh, the opposition between Polonies, what you call ontological yeah. reading and resistance, and, and, and replacing that with a, what you call structural um, 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 view or approach, which uh, and, and basing that on 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 the same ideas as, uh, as Hegel used in his in, in 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 saying that that society cannot be based on contract because because uh, going into a contract already uh, already presupposes the notion of contract and, and a system where contracts are are, are kept. Uh, so. Uh, I, I, I like that because it allows you to talk about sustainability, as you as you said. That then the, the issues of sustainability, which are so 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 crucial, um, and and um, that's great. What I have a little bit of difficulty with uh, now here is that the the third dimension of sustainability, the uh, reproduction, yeah. uh, social re reproduction, uh, m seems to be named as feminist. 
mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, and so it's it, it kind of, uh, um, what I'm a little bit afraid there is that, that kind of social reproduction and care and effective labor equals women equals right, right, right. feminism. And um, um, if, uh, if it could, uh, to approach it from another di dimension, if you, if you look at feminist politics at the moment, of, or feminism as, as politics at the moment, I've, uh, some people, I've, I've recently heard some analysis in, a, in just discussions where we, which, which uh, note that uh, whereas uh, some time ago, still 15, 20 years ago, feminist, uh, one of the kind of dimensions of feminism, feminist politics was, uh, uh, was uh, both kind of uh, Public and private, and and mm -hmm. uh, issue, and the and the uh, mm -hmm. differences in between uh, reason and and emotions, like yeah. affect and that. And there seems to have, at the moment, when you think about feminist <coughs> agenda, there seems to be some a, a, a change, uh, so that these these dichotomies don't need to mm -hmm. tend to yeah. to hold as much. Mm -hmm. And a good example of that being that that effective labor is talked generally in society. Care is a big societal program. It's not anymore a feminist issue. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of one of the big, huge issues of the of, of, of the time in general. And so, I, my question probably would be that uh, concerning feminist agenda at the moment, um, do you uh, uh, do you see uh, uh, what would you see at uh, the mm -hmm. The particular, particular feminist issues at the at, at the time, if yeah. if this is uh, not the only candidate or not the not, right. not the feminist issue, so the other ones. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that ob uh, observation and that question. And I'm completely um, sympathetic to your worry here. The last thing I would want would be to set up that equation, social reproduction equals care, equals women, and equals feminism. Um, what I really uh, meant to say is that um, social reproduction, I, I really want to understand social reproduction in a very broad sense. It, Important elements of it go on in households, but all sorts of uh, aspects of social reproduction go on elsewhere, in civil society, in neighborhoods, in communities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to reduce it to care in the way that is usually understood as a private domestic uh, occupation. Um, and, um, but I think, I think what I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm saying a couple of things here. One is that um, this um, whole terrain is not being adequately theorized by anybody. The people who are doing the best job, uh, who are, have a, a certain stake in it, are feminists. Uh, but that's part of this problem of critical separatism. And I even used the word ghettoization at one point. Uh, this terrain, it, it should be um, you know, of interest to all critical theory. So that's, that's one point. A second point is that um, nevertheless, I, I, I'm with you about getting beyond dichotomies, but um, nevertheless, one has to also reckon seriously in one's thinking with the way that capitalism uh, entrenches and institutionalizes a dichotomy between production and reproduction. As I understand it, this uh, dichotomy is an artifact of capitalism. Previously, um, this um, these activities, this work of social reproduction was um, not sharply separated from what we call production. I mean, just re recall the uh, sort of um, the artisanal right, form of production in which you have right, a kind of a, a selling point on the, <laughs> the ground floor, a workshop above it, 
you know, a kitchen and uh, above that, bedrooms for journeymen and so, I mean, it, it, these are situations, it, it's, it's the separation and privatization of social reproduction and its association with women. Women's work prior to capitalism was much more publicly visible. It, it always differed from men's work. There was always a sort of gender division. But there wasn't this sharp um, institutional separation and tendency to occult the, the importance of this. So I think we, much as we, d we don't want to encourage these dichotomies, but still we need to sort of understand how this dichotomy gets institutionalized and, 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 and how to make visible the background condition of possibility for the foreground exploitation of labor that Marx uh, theorized very nicely. Um, and so where does that leave the agenda for feminism today? Well, I think I want to say several things on this point. Um, I think the uh, the feminist agenda is, is almost um, or should be limitless. I mean, I don't think there's any issue that is not pertinent in in which there is not a gender strand that if feminists don't bring out will go missing. Right? No one else is going to do it. Um, so. Um, I, I just I just don't uh, see you know um, wherever there is sort of struggle and protest there have to be feminists that would be point one um, on the other hand what I was saying about the triple movement um, uh, I didn't bring this out but you know I've been sort of uh, along with Hester Eisenstein and a few other people I've been very concerned about a kind of unholy alliance or dangerous liaison between the dominant currents of feminism, that is liberal feminism, and the, the, the neoliberal. So, I mean, if I had to sort of say, go further than I did here about this idea of the triple movement, it would be that the, um, the feminist agenda today should be to, to try to break this dangerous liaison with a kind of uncritical meritocratic, individualistic, let's, you know, like um, this big bestseller in the United States, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Yahoo. I, I mean, this is sort of what passes for feminism in many circles. And um, just read a really interesting uh, paper about sort of femocrats in the European Union and so on. So, so uh, I think that, that, that maybe if, the agenda, uh, and from my point of view, would be to break that dangerous liaison, if possible, and try, and this would be very difficult, I can't say how, but try to forge some new principled alliance with social protection, which is often, I mean, the most um, visible and intense forms of social protection are quite reactionary. Uh, but nevertheless, that, that I think is the in broad brush strokes, where one has to go. All right. Ne next question. Uh, uh, ne next to the previous one, actually. <laughs> so you could have just given the microphone directly. And then the two following questions back there. So uh, please keep it very, very and brief be because brief. we don't have very much time. Uh, hi. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a, a quick comment and a quick question. Uh, first, uh, I think one of the things that's missing from the most of the, uh, the critical literature regarding the, the capit capitalist today and uh, the neoliberalism is the fact that capitalism itself is a commodity um, that's, that's, that, that is traded globally continuously. Uh, it's, it, it gets maybe a bit out of fashion here in the West, uh, but it gets very popular in, in, the, in 
in, in the East. Uh, people are buying capitalism uh, in large scales there. Uh, okay, so for us, it might be cool to say, yeah, yeah, let's let's get rid of the capitalist because it, it did so much, so much, uh, so, so, so much damage. But uh, we can say that because we have already an infrastructure built upon a capitalism that was here for for uh, for quite a long time. Okay, uh, and my question will be. Um, in your opinion, uh, why do you think the uh, Occupy movement failed? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's great. <laughs> great question. Um, I mean, when you say people want capitalism in, in, in uh, many parts of the world, in the, in, in the global south, so-called, so, so I mean, the point is there is something worse than not being than being exploited, and that's not being exploited. There really is. That's what I, you know, been trying to stress here about how, and that's why I'm opposed to this kind of prohibitionism. No more commodification of care. No more commodification of labor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, but you know, just look at the um, at the. Um, Garment workers in Dakar and in, in Bangladesh. I mean, they're, people don't want buildings to collapse on them, even though they want jobs. So um, the, the the you know and in other words, what the, our job, as I see it, the job of a critical theorist is to figure out how um, to organize an economy so that. People who have been shut out have opportunities, have uh, uh, the capacity to support their families and uh, and to and, and to live a, a decent life. And the question is, the, uh, the question is whether capitalism can actually provide that today. It's not clear to me that it can. Or, I mean, there's partly a semantic issue. I mean, I, you know, Polanyi is not a Marxist. If, if you ask what follows politically for Polanyi, I think it would be something like this, that labor, nature, and finance need to be, if not totally decommodified, then very robustly regulated. You might ask, is that enough? Someone before I spoke about the, the pro underlying property relations. Is that enough? My, I, I'm adopting a position that I call, with some a, a wink at uh, Gayatri Spivak, strategic agnosticism. In other words, um, this would be such an enormous improvement over what we have now, right? Um, but would it? it give us everything we want, well, let's try it and we'll see, and if not, we'll do more. That's, that's the sort of line I'm, uh, I'm pushing. Why did Occupy fail? Um, lots of reasons. Um, I mean, what was interesting in the United States was how quickly the uh, support, uh, you know, grew so it's up to nearly 70% of the U.S. population in opinion polling supported the movement after a few weeks. Um, what didn't happen was um, a, a development of any way to turn that support into some enduring, you know, political campaign. Let's say. Um, and one thing that uh, clearly the um, the evictions from the public spaces was you know catastrophic. It really shows how important actual public space is as opposed to simply cyberspace. Not that cyberspace isn't important, but uh, without it, w it became impossible to sort of keep the public attention on that once those spaces were gone. Secondly, and it pains me to say this since there's a lot of the, uh, several uh, of the core sort of people are my own students, there's a kind of neo-anarchism that is rampant among youthful activists today that I think in the end is really counterproductive. 
we have to face up to the organizational question somehow, and it's not easy. I don't know the answer. No one is for a Leninist party, but if you're serious about changing really fundamental, deep structural things, you have to have something to say about organization. And the, the sort of principled refusal to even take up the question um, seems to be problematic. But look, we haven't heard the last of this. The same sentiments and the same problems continue. And um, uh, there will be more such things and maybe people will learn some lessons from how easy it is for this to rise up and then dissipate and, and think more about these questions. All right, let's take a couple of more questions uh, back there first, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Fraser, for a really good lecture. Uh, you, in, oh, okay, in, in the passing, you, you mentioned patents, but I would be interested in hearing, I would be inter patents, but I would be interesting, interested in hearing uh, how intellectual property rights fit into the framework you presented, especially when it comes to intellectual property rights as, on the other hand, a form of, of human and social uh, products, and on the other hand, as, as legal concept and, and commodities. Yeah, it's a great question, and I want to refer you to uh, the recent work of Bob Jessup, who has uh, developed a very interesting idea that knowledge is a fourth fictitious commodity. He's using Polanyi's idea. So what we're talking about here, again, is another, let's say, background condition for commodification. That, it, it, you know, historically, it has just been the sort of informal transition, tra transmission of know-how that, right, uh, that lays behind agriculture and, and all sorts of other production. Then with the rise of modern science, we get codified knowledge uh, as the, uh, the background condition for uh, technologically, right, organized production. And um, which still had the form of a commons. There was still the idea in, in, in science until relatively recently uh, um, yes, that patents, you know, have to expire uh, after a certain time, and science itself is, in, in principle, open, right? It's a commons. Now what we're getting, and the Polanyian analysis fits this very nicely, is an a new enclosure of a commons, so that um, increasingly research in universities is funded, I don't know if this is the case in Finland, but in the United States, in increasingly uh, corporate funded research with uh, very um, uh, tight restrictions on its publication. If uh, res research sponsored by a pharmaceutical corporation, for example, shows it's, that something is unsafe, they actually have the right to suppress it it's their research, they paid for it, it doesn't have to be, it's, it's not public unless they decide to make it public. Uh, that's an extreme case, but, um, and obviously the, the, the attempt to, the struggles uh, with, uh, in India uh, over uh, the attempt to patent basmati rice and other, you know, historic forms of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge and know-how and, uh, uh, I mean, this is a, a new enclosure movement. So I think, and, and it, it fits, uh, as far as I can see, all of the, um, the sort of general uh, conceptual right, uh, structure that I was laying out for the other fictitious commodities. I think that knowledge is a very good candidate for a, a fourth fictitious commodity, another indispensable background condition for commodification that is itself in the, you know, in process of being a commodified and that could, uh, if Jessup is right, uh, right, introduce these same tail biting, you know, difficulties that we're seeing. Now, I think we only have time for one more question. Erika Kiss, please. Please speak to the microphone. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm a, a 
scholar of literature and, and film, so this is not a specialist question, but I'm also an admirer of Polanyi. And um, I wanted to ask whether I understood you well that uh, emancipation for you is uh, the right to to come out of the shadow labor and sell, to, to marketize. You again in, in, in the uh, repeated and said that exploitation uh, seems to be better than, uh, but then you yourself reflected on the fact that, for example, if women want to come out of uh, uh, this condition and be able to sell their labor, the exploitation is going to continue uh, and the domination that comes with it vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, lesser powerful women uh, who will carry their children for them and uh, uh, and be happy to be exploited and it goes down uh, like so I don't understand <coughs> what kind of emancipation Great. that is and uh, 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 another question it's a technical thing that I don't think that there is any problem with Polanyi's model of the of um, um, the ontological uh, argument for um, how um, labor power that's not produced for um, sale is ontologically uh, in, in, instable. I think it's a it's a second like I don't know that I just I just felt like mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with the description or the model itself. Mm -hmm. You don't like that he thinks that uh, it has to be protected. You want. <coughs> Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that, 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 that the model is wrong, the ontological mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I'm, I'm playing with one uh, dimension <coughs> where one could maybe get out of this circle, and that's education, which is for me so a question of social reproduction because we are not just produced by our parents biologically, but we are also produced by our education. <coughs> And uh, that education is the only gentle way of uh, of maybe um, uh, leaning in, not into marketization, but against, or against that kind of productivity. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, maybe a very ideal, uh, idealistic uh, <coughs> uh, notion of liberal education that is trying to inculcate uh, um, uh, a gentler, uh, kind of human right. nature. Good. Thanks a lot. Um, you, I mean, I, I, um, I didn't say uh, very much and not enough about what I meant by emancipation. Um, I, I, I've written uh, a couple of other papers about Polanyi that really present this idea of a triple movement, the critique of the double movement and the a proposal of the alternative idea of a, of a triple movement um, where that's the focus and it's more developed here. It's true, I just sort of snuck it in very quickly in the course of trying to mainly talk about fictitious commodification. So I'm not surprised that it wasn't fully clear. Um, my idea is this. Um, I, I'm working with a very thin concept of emancipation. All I mean by it is the struggle, the desire, the impulse to overcome domination. And so everything depends on the form of domination that is at issue in a given point. So it could be perda, uh, right, in, a, uh, in an Asian context where a woman is literally secluded and not allowed uh, to leave her house. It could be um, the um, uh, s being subject to rape and other uh, forms of violence uh, in a highly modern uh, urban context, right? Not being able to walk in the streets late at night alone uh, without uh, feeling uh, unsafe. Um, and um, the, I don't... Um, I'm, I don't mean at all to suggest that um, emancipation means only the struggle to be an economic 
agent in your own right to come out of coverture as the as, as you know in the, in European history in other words to be able to sign contracts to control your own wages all of those things that um, 19th century feminists fought for uh, against coverture to be able to own property and so on these are this is complicated uh, in, in, in in the US um, in some cases, the, what was being fought for was was the right of uh, southern planter uh, wives to buy and sell slaves while their husbands were away fighting against uh, abolition. So I, I, this is not... I, the, the marketizing thing is a double-edged or multi-edged sword. It's not, it's not something I'm endorsing per se, and I'm not equating it to emancipation. What I'm suggesting is that even emancipation is ambivalent. You can um, free yourself from one aspect of domination and land yourself in another, or land somebody else in another, uh, become a dominator. Um, so that's why all of these uh, everything depends, in my view, on how the, the struggle for emancipation is sh in, encounters and is shaped by other political forces. For me, emancipation is not the all-encompassing name for everything good. And it's ambivalent, just as I think marketization is ambivalent, and just as I think I suggested, social protection is ambivalent. Yeah, it can protect you from the ravages of the market, but it can also entrench hierarchies and exclusions. Each of these things is ambivalent, and that's why each needs to correct the other in the right way and be brought together in the right way. Um, well, I think we, I, I, I'm, I mean, we. I think it would take a longer discussion. We don't have time to figure out what you mean when you say you don't think the ontological model is wrong. I think I gave some uh, powerful reasons as to what's wrong with it and another way to read it. But again, we'd have to pursue that um, further. Um, ed on education, I think that brings us back to this problem of knowledge as a fourth fictitious commodity. Is education a public good? What, how much does it cost uh, to go to a university now? Uh, by the way, uh, you, I'm sure you've been reading about student debt. This is the new, mor uh, the new toxic mortgages. Now they're tranching and selling and uh, speculating in student debt. This is only, uh, and which of course means that students can't start families, can't buy houses, can't do all the sorts of things that would actually be needed to revive economies. So um, I, I think the whole question of education uh, is, is, this is social reproduction. This is really what I was thinking of before when I said it's not just what goes on privately in houses. It is the f formation, exactly, both of specific occupational training and skills, but also of this formation of and cultivation of what it means to be, right, a, um, a participating member of society in the broadest sense. But that, too, is being commodified and privatized. Now the time oh, is you. out, so unfortunately we can't take any more questions at this point. So thank you once more, Professor Fraser. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>